right, welcome to tonight's uh, session on estate planning. This is the third and final one that we're doing for now. Uh, I'm Liz from the Bozeman Public Library, and before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Getting, I'm just going to do a couple little rundown about Zoom. You've probably all heard this before. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar. You do not have video, and you uh, cannot share your audio, so you can show up in your pajamas with a screaming kid behind you, and no one will know. Uh, you can interact with us via polls, and we'll go over that. And um, the Q&A session down at the bottom of your screen, uh, if you have any questions, you can type them in there. If you want to get our attention uh, because you are working on a question or something, you can raise your hand. That's an option as well. Uh, so this uh, presentation is being recorded, and all of these are being posted online, the YouTube page. My email is in the event calendar, so if you have any follow-up questions about how to access these recordings or um, get access to some of these uh, documents that we'll talk about or the website, uh, you can send me an email and I might try to help or direct you to the right place. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Yenning. Please take it away. Thank you. Okay, Liz. Well, delighted to have the opportunity to share more information uh, with individuals. And I guess you could say that I represent the uh, opportunity for you to know about our land grant institution. That's what Montana State University is all about. And we take the university to the people. And that's why we have county extension agents across the state of Montana. And they are the ones that plan for me to come out and do live programs. Some of them are doing uh, virtual seminars like this. And others are using our fabulous Fridays, and then they have me get on to ans answer questions. So it's a great opportunity, and I do thank the Bozeman Library for this opportunity, and particularly, of course, Liz. And, uh, you know, every week I've said she's been this way. Well, tonight she says she wants me to be stimulating and electrifying. Oh, boy, I'm going to try. And of course, don't put people to sleep. So I hope you had a chance, grab some bite, have some coffee still. And what we're going to do is look at some of the engagement tools that I like to use for a webinar. Because what I find is, oh, they can get so boring and you can fall asleep in the middle if you're not careful. So do take advantage of the opportunity to enter your your questions in the chat room. And if there's one that I don't know the answer to, I will find out and I promise to get back to you. Because I've been doing this a lot of time and I can anticipate some of the questions, but every now and then there's one that comes up that I went, oh my goodness, that's an excellent question, but I don't know the answer. So feel free to ask. Then let's look at uh, an example poll question. Uh, what I'm interested in is, I see February 3rd. I don't know that it was February 3rd, but anyway, if you added a POD to your um, financial accounts, let us know that. If you did a TOD on your stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, um, maybe you didn't attend that particular session, and maybe you shared information about transfer on death deeds and you read some of the information uh, that we do have available, uh, and you did download the beneficiary designation for a vehicle, which is that MV13, for those of you that maybe did not attend that last session. And I got to say, this is really neat, uh, Liz, to be able to see on the screen. I was doing a program for another organization, and there was no way I could see what the poll was doing. So I would have to say, Liz, what are they saying? But it looks like we've got 20% that did add a POD. We had information that people were sharing. That's good. And they read some of the information. And then we've got some that are entering information in the chat room to let us know what you did. So that is great to know. And I thank you very much for sharing that. It makes me feel better when people are doing as a result of my program, doing things. That's what I want you to do. Now, what else do we need to look about to get ready? Oh, that's my engagement tool number three. 
And if you've been here before, you know that I am a wildlife nut. I really enjoy wildflowers and it's been really fun to try to connect the wildflowers as reminders of some of the key points that we'll be looking at in this particular webinar. So we've got Mariposa lily, sky pilot, Richardson geranium, and the middle one there that's green with a heart on it, I call that the love plant. I don't know if that's what it is, but it's what I took when I was in Botswana and I could never find it in the book. And then on the left, we have Palmer's Pinstamins. Okay, this particular wildflower is a steer's head. And what that steer's head tells me is I want you to become aware of some of the potential uses of a revocable trust in an estate plan. And I also then want you to be aware that we do have another kind of trust out there that is called a testamentary. And a testamentary means that is one that you have formed after you pass away through a written will. So the sugar bowl, well, isn't that a pretty flower? And I'm using that to represent trust, okay? And well, it really reminds me of my mom. Back in the day when I was just a little kid, she would take money and she'd put it in a sugar bowl at the top of the kitchen cabinet. Now, I'm sure I really wasn't supposed to be noticing that, but when she was gone once, I crawled up on the, on the counter and looked inside and I saw that she was placing money in there. Ah, but you know what she's spending on? wasn't anything fun from a kid perspective. It was for a vacuum sweeper. But that was her way of socking away money. And that's what people do in a trust. They kind of sock away their investments, their assets, so they can control what happens with those. So you need to know that a trust really is something that becomes a legal entity. And that legal entity is the one that has title to your property, okay? So once you have a house, and right now it's in your name as John and Mary Jones, well, if you're going to put that in a trust, you have to change the title to the name of the trust. And there are lots of trusts out there. We've got revocable, we've got testamentary, we've got uh, irrevocable, Q-tips, Q-dots, Oh my, there's a lot of them out there. And that doesn't mean we want to have all of them, but the two prominent ones tend to be the revocable one and the testamentary trust one. So share with me, you're here for a reason, and would you share with me what you have heard about why you should have a revocable trust? What is it that you've read in the paper? Maybe you've had an attorney mention these things. Maybe you've been out for coffee and you've got a friend that says, oh, that's the only way to, you just want to avoid probate. Do a revocable living trust and your family will love you forever. So let me know what kinds of things that you've heard. So while we're waiting for people to respond, I did get one question that popped up. Okay. Is it necessary to file a transfer of death, death deed if both spouses have their names on a deed? Okay, repeat that again. Is it necessary to file a transfer of death deed if both spouses have their names on the deed? Okay, you know, that's what people say about joint tenancies. We've got joint tenancies, and if one of us dies, the other receives it. Well, the question is, what if both of you die? Who receives that joint tenancy property then? Well, you can have a will that expresses that, or you could have your transfer on death deed where you have named a beneficiary as well as a successor beneficiary in case the first one dies with you or even before you. Okay. So that's kind of my response to that one. 
Right. Now, as we look at uh, poll two here, we are seeing that uh, there's uh, a lot of people that have heard that you save money by avoiding probate. We've seen some that say save state and federal uh, income taxes, save capital gain taxes, and oh my goodness, save assets for the heirs, and it qualifies you, qualifies you for Medicaid. Okay. I got to tell you this right now, you put your assets into a, a revocable living trust and it does not automatically qualify you for Medicaid. Now, as far as saying saving capital gain tax, well, it depends. In one of our other sessions, we may have talked about a step up in basis. Like if I had some stock for $10 and I willed that stock or I used a transfer on death registration to Liz and it's worth a million dollars. She sells it. Okay, she doesn't have a capital gain if she sells it for that $1 million. And the same applies to a trust. If the trust had some stock in there that was worth $10 and then you die and it goes into the trust and then the trust sells it, the trust is, is treated just like you and I would be. And so there's no capital gain there. And uh, save money by avoiding probate. We're going to look at that one a little more closely. So it's good. Thank you for sharing that. It got me on my soapbox right away to say, trust, don't do some of these things that you've heard about. Okay, now let's look at the number of percentage or the percentage of people that do have revocable trusts. And it's not as big a percentage as you would think it is, or I thought it would be. Uh, one of the studies of AARP revealed that only 29% of those individuals over age 75 do have a revocable trust. But my guess is if they did that research today, it would be a higher amount because there's been lots of people out there selling revocable trusts. Now, the neat thing about a revocable trust is, you know, you establish it during your lifetime and you can change it. You can even terminate it at any time you want to. And people say they like it because it's private. It's not like a will that's submitted for probate. And every Tom, Dick, and Harry could go into the clerk of the district court and read your will. Well, as a practical matter, I don't think that happens. But yeah, it, it is more private because it's not a public document. And the thing about saving inheritance taxes Bull, no way, because we don't have an inheritance tax, which I mentioned. Also, the people that are worried about the federal estate tax, hey, this year you can have 12.92 million as a single individual, and you do not have to pay a federal estate tax. And those of you that are married, oh, double that. It's $25 million, $840,000. That is quite an exemption. And what that tells us, or I know, is that only 0.02 Montanans end up paying the federal estate tax. And believe me, they're going to use a lot of other ways other than a revocable trust to save on that. Because you see, if you have a revocable trust, it's just like it's you. So therefore, that amount would be included in uh, your estate. So I'll bet you those folks with that large they don't have a revocable trust either. Now, here we have a false Solomon seal. Different flower, very pretty. So that reminds me that I am going to uh, ask a question about John. And he has $200,000 200, of assets that are in his revocable trust. Because his wife has zero assets, she is automatically eligible to receive Medicaid. Would you say that's true or would you say that is false? Okay, it looks like 
you guys were paying attention because 100% of you say that that is it, indeed false. And that's true. That's one of the giveaways that I gave to you. But now I know you were paying attention because what we've got here is false. And the reason it's false is she's not eligible for Medicaid because having a revocable living trust is just like having it in your own name. So therefore the Medicaid department accepts that as you have an asset. And that's more than the $2,000 of the eligibility of resources. So why would we have a revocable trust? Well, maybe we have enough relatives that have had Alzheimer's that we want to think about forming one so that if we're diagnosed with a doctor, by a doctor with Alzheimer's, uh, we have the successor trustee step in and manage the trust for us. We might want to use one in case we have a remarriage. In other words, we've got the husband that's going to keep some of the assets in his name only. The wife is going to keep assets in her name so that they could both establish a trust to make sure that that property gets to their children. So in other words, they're not going to put it in a joint tenancy with right of survivorship because if one dies, the other receives it and the person that dies kids, zip, they don't receive anything. Now, one of the things that uh, I talk about in some of my meetings is a qualified terminal interest property trust. That's hard to pronounce. Qualified terminable interest property trust. Just think of it as a Q-tip, you know, those things you use in your ears. Well, what this provision allows is for a surviving spouse to have use of the assets that are placed in the trust, and then we utilize the income that is generated. So just to give you an example here, we have a husband who had property in his name only, and what he did was put it into a Q-tip. And then what he said is, I want my wife to have in her, in this Q-tip, the land and the home. Now, as a result of that, she gets the land, she gets the home, but it's already predetermined in the Q-tip that that property then when she dies goes to his two children. So in that way, it's similar to a life estate, but at the same time, a life estate does not have enough details. If you say, I just leave it to my spouse, as a life estate and the remainder to my children. And that's all you say. We don't know who's paying the property tax. We don't know who's going to pay the insurance and some of those kinds of issues. So by putting it into a Q-tip with the directions in there, it makes it clear to anybody that can read exactly what it was you wanted. But you can also decide that maybe uh, your kids are fine and what he does is leave the Q-tip trust to the Montana 4-H Foundation. And we could even say it's for Gallatin County only. So that would work. So the caution that I want to give you is I'm aware of a story of a grandma and a grandpa. And in this particular case, the father, who's the grandpa, was disinheriting one of the sons. The wife knew it. But she wasn't real strong. And what she thought is, I'll wait till dad's gone and then I'll change it. And what she didn't know is that revocable trust became irrevocable at his death. So she couldn't change the parameters around that and make sure that the third son also received his share. So that's something to think about. Okay, we could still then give it to the 4-H Foundation for use in Gallatin County. And just to repeat, it goes to the children. Okay, now, I think, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that, folks. No wonder I thought, oh, how could I get all these repeats in here? <laughs> okay. 
told that story. Okay, so don't get bowled over with a revocable living trust until you learn more about them. And that's why we have a book guide on revocable living trust is to provide more information. Now, here we have what I think is a beautiful glacier lily. And it's really fun when you see the, the different colors, and I'm going to get this word wrong, anthers or whatever they are. We've seen them white. We've seen them red. We've seen them yellow and almost black when they're almost finished. So it's fun to see them in these different levels. So what we've got here is trust terminology that I want the glacier lily to inform us about. And it has to do with names, trustees, all that type of thing. So first of all, if you decide you're going to have a revocable trust, you need to make a decision on the name. So it could be Glacier Lily and Dogtooth Lily as trustees of the Lily Family Trust that was dated March 20th, 2023. That is the official name of that particular trust. And then you need to decide, you know, terminology. We've got the trustors, the settlers, and the granters. These all three names have been used in trusts at some point in time in Montana. But basically, it's the person, person's name who puts the assets into the trust. So in our case, it's Glacier Lily and Dogtooth Lily. Then in this case, the lilies have reserved rights. They want to be able to change the trust. They want to be able to change beneficiaries. They want to be able to maybe name a different trustee. They want to be able to revoke it and retitle it in case laws change or family circumstances change. So those are all the things that can go into a trust that gives them rights to make those changes. Now, when you have a trustee, that's the person that makes decisions about how the assets are uh, spent based on um, the document. Well, in this case, the trustees and the trustors are the same people. It's Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Glacier Lily, and they are the initial trustees. And then they have um, their trustors and trustees. That's what they are. Then the successor trustee is the individual that takes over. Uh, if they become deceased, they are incapacitated. Uh, maybe they don't act for whatever reason, or they just up and resign because they don't want to do it anymore. And then that's when the son, Dogtooth Jr., is going to step in. Now, you could have somebody else other than Dogtooth. You know, you could have your adult grandchild a trusted friend, uh, maybe even a charity or a nonprofit or a corporate trustee manage your trust given the trust document and the rules that you outlined in there. So who can be the beneficiaries of your trust? Well, it's just like writing a will. You make a decision. Do you want it to be your children, your grandchildren, trusted friends, or maybe you have a favorite charity or nonprofit? So those are the ones that you would list as beneficiaries. Now, every trust is going to have a written agreement. That is the directions. You're telling the trustee how to manage this. You're gone. They can't talk to you anymore. So what is it that you wanted to have happen? Well, I'm aware of a grandfather. He had, get this, a 90-page trust agreement. And in this, he was saying for his grandson to get money, he had to go to a certain university, he had to major in a certain thing, and he had to get all A's. And if he didn't, he doesn't get a dime from that there trust. We call that dead hand control. Grandpa is trying to control behavior from the grave. So just think, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen in 50 years or something like that. But that's what he said. It's his rules. Now, if you're going to have a revocable trust, one of the things you need to do is change the assets 
the name of the asset. So right now it might be John and Mary Jones, but you've got to change that into the Lilly Family Trust, dated March 20th, 2023. And the assets you're, you're going to place in the trust, you know, if you're going to have one, I dare say your attorney is going to recommend everything goes in there. Land, home, checking account, certificates of deposit, stocks, bonds, mutual fund, and vehicles. So those are a lot of things to have to change the title to, to get them into that trust. Remember, remember this, the trust document only controls items that are in the name of the trust. It can't control anything that is not in the name of the trust. If you don't include everything, then what we've got is that property passing by a will, the law of interstate secession that we call it in Montana. It means you're dying without a will. Or we've talked about beneficiary designations. So the beneficiary designations are going to take priority if they're not in the name of the trust. Now, what does it cost? I get that question a lot, and it's really hard to tell. You know, I hear anywhere from 2000 to 8000 for a married couple. And of course, it depends on the complexity that you've got there. And a single person, 1500 to 5000 So I got to say, I guess it depends. Okay, now, I'm curious. Do you have a revocable trust? Real quick, yes or no? Looks like we got eight out of nine responses. Yeah, okay. And I'm looking there saying 88% say that they don't. So I'm going to just make the assumption there that you are attending this to find out some more information to see if you really are interested in having a revocable trust. Okay, now you have decisions. If you decide to have a trust, what is going to be the name, who's going to be your trustees, who is going to be your beneficiaries, what assets are you going to place in the trust, and what directions do you want to have in the trust document. And of course, your attorney is going to be able to help you with a lot of this. But if you're really thinking about it, sit down, save money by having some of this in your own mind, okay? Now here we have claret cups. And these I found in Utah and they were so beautiful this day. And we came back the next day, they were all closed up. Eh, but they were really pretty that day. So I wanna clarify the language because you will see some statements like this. The truster hereby specifically declares that upon the event of the truster's incapacity or death, this trust shall become and remain irrevocable. So that tells us the story I told about the grandpa, this was the kind of information that was in the trust. And one decision you'll need to make is who do you want to determine you are incapacitated? You know, um, is it going to be your physician? Is it going to be your spouse? I don't know if I'm going to give my hubby that control. But anyway, take a look. Who do you want to decide you're incapacitated? Now, this is an example of a trust a document that a person wanted me to look at. And I said, ah, I can't look at it. I'm not an attorney. I can't give you advice. But then I looked at it. And I was glad that I did because when I saw this language, I was very disappointed in the attorney because the attorney is talking about may in its sole and absolute discretion purchase assets from the estate for fair market value or upon written request of said personal representative. No, you don't have a personal representative if you have a trust. Okay. And then he also talks about a succeeding joint tenant. No, we don't have joint tenancies in a trust. 
So this kind of language shouldn't even appear at all. How do you decide what's going on with that kind of language? And then they talk about this right of representation. That's how the beneficiaries are going to receive the assets that are in the trust. Well, let's look at the Claret Cup family. Here they were in the 90s. Everybody is doing fine. But then we get later on and we discover a son died, uh, airplane crash. We had a daughter die uh, in Eastern Montana, car wreck. Then dad died of a heart attack. So here we have mom or grandma. She's the survivor. She has all the property in her name only. She dies without writing a will. So the question becomes for you guys, what fraction, if any, is this grandchild going to receive? So I'm going to let you look at that a second. Okay, we've got those that are in black are deceased. Son died first, daughter died next. And so the question becomes, what fraction, if any, are you going to give that individual? So... I have the big print and uh, Liz has the smaller print, but I can see that you're reading and you're voting. Okay, what I'm seeing here is that 67% of you are giving a ninth. We've got 17% that are doing a sixth. And then we've got 17% of you that are mean. In other words, you're not going to give that child anything or the grandchild. Well, let's see who has it correct. And it's those that said one ninth, because right of representation tells us that we've got the grandchildren sort of representing their folks. And we see here the sun on the left with the turquoise child. It goes directly to that turquoise child. And then those green grandchildren receive a ninth because a third of a third is a ninth. So that's right of representation, which you can have in your trust. And Montana has it in the law of interstate secession. And we see that wording in a lot of the wills. Well, next time you're having coffee with someone, ask them if they know what right of representation means. Then, if you want, email me and I'll send this to you as an attachment so you can tell them exactly what it means. Right of representation. Now, another thing you're going to have to clarify in the document is exactly when do you want your beneficiaries to receive the income and the assets? So the income could be monthly, quarterly, yearly. So this would be like you've got a lot of money in there and it earns interest and that's income. So what do we, when do we want to give it? The other one has to do with assets. There's assets into that trust. Is it going to be on the death of the trustees or the trustors? Is it going to be when the person graduates for college? What about getting married? What about having a baby? Uh, at some point in time in the future where you say 40, 55, or like one lady told me, she's getting hers when she's 65. So we can definitely not call her a trust brat because she doesn't get it until then. The other thing is you can also clarify your beneficiaries and make your favorite nonprofit uh, as the beneficiary of the assets in the trust. So, of course, my favorite one is the Montana 4-H Foundation. So, again, don't forget, you got to change the title to the name of the trust. So, just to clarify you'll want to ask, a ask the attorney about any terms that are used in the trust that you don't understand. And we have a mock guide that I mentioned on revocable trusts, and we have another mock guide on testamentary trusts.
because I get so many questions about those. Now we have a meadow death camas. And that makes me think of a testamentary trust. And this is one that is created by your will and it only becomes effective after the death of the person that made the will. So a testamentary trust then can be changed as often as you want to. You write a new will, you can change the rules and regulations about your particular trust. You can also do a codicil, you know, instead of retyping the 90 page thing, we could just do a, a codicil where you offer explanations, you can change a provision, uh, you can alter it, you can revoke prov uh, provisions that are in that uh, will. In your will, you're going to do the same as the test as the revocable trust. You want a trustee, you want a successor trustee, and you have to decide who the beneficiaries are, just like writing a will. And why would you wait for doing your trust at your death? Well, you really do it before, but it goes into effect after you die. Some people just want to keep the titles in their name right now. They don't want to put it in the name of the trust. Um, they don't want the cost of changing all of their property, uh, you know, and changing and cost can be money, but it could also be the time that it takes. They don't want the hassle. That's okay. And I got a little bit more later about why. But testamentary trusts can be formed by a person's will that can be changed up until the time you die. You can write a new will or you can add a codicil to your present will. Now, here we have Richardson's geranium. And that reminds me of my favorite person, Granny Richardson. And Granny is wanting to do some estate planning and she wants to treat all five grandchildren equally. So she's got TODs on some of her uh, mutual funds. She's got PODs on each of her CDs. And what does she discover? She's not treating her children or grandchildren equally if she died today. One's going to get 10,000 plus, the other's going to get 14,000 plus. So what could Granny do? How could she handle this uneven distribution? Well, one of the things she could do is establish a, a testamentary trust that she writes in her will. And then she can also be a little bit clever by designating the testamentary trust as beneficiary of all her assets. In other words, what she can do is use PODs and TODs with her um, leaving of the property into the trust. She can do a transfer on death deed and have her property go into the trust and direct that it would be sold. She can have, if she has a retirement plan, she can have beneficiary designations of that. And she would say the beneficiary is her trust and the name of that trust. She'll also have, at the suggestion of the attorney, a, a pour over will section section, excuse me, in the will. And attorneys like to do that just in case she forgot to do an asset. Because if you forget to do that, that particular asset means they've got to open up a probate unless we have this will that also takes care of that. So we can look at plan A. One of the, grant, uh, the plans that granny could do is say, I'm just going to leave it equally to my grandchildren upon my death. So that means her five grandchildren all receive one fifth each. That might be what they prefer, but it's granny's decision. Well, granny has plan B to consider because she can do one trust for all of her grands. She can instruct the trustee to pay for books and tuition for each grand. So you see, she had to define for her trustee what does she consider as education? And then upon graduation of the last grant, the trustee then distributes the property to the grandchildren. 
So we can take a look at the different years that these grandchildren are graduating. And what we see is Bob is the very last. Bob graduates in 2020. So at that point, what happens is the trustee has been directed, give what's left in that trust to all five grandchildren, one-fifth, one-fifth, and one-fifth, so on. Now, let's complicate it for Granny, because maybe she has a different objective here. Maybe she says, I still want to pay for tuition and books for each of my grandchildren. But upon their graduation, I want to distribute the balance to my favorite nonprofit. She feels she's giving a good start to those kids with some type of degree. And maybe she'll decide uh, welding would qualify. She might decide a beautician, a beautician school would qualify. There's different kinds of education and not all of them would have to be quotes college. So this is what happens here in 2020. Once again, Bob is our last one to graduate. So when he does, what happens then is maybe they want to distribute the, the asset to the AARP Foundation. How about the Bozeman Library Foundation? That would be another good one. So the benefits of having this testamentary trust is she doesn't have to keep changing these beneficiary designations, trying to keep it equal. That was just, you know, driving her crazy. And I understand that. And then uh, the neat thing is the beneficiaries creditors don't have a right to raid the trust if the kids end up owing money. So that's another benefit that is there. So a testamentary trust could be a useful to, tool for treating your children uh, or grandchildren equally with that. Now, with this Explorers Gentian, what I want to explore is other uses for a testamentary trust. You know, parents, you hoo parents, you might want to have a testamentary trust if something happens to both of you and you want to name a trustee to manage the assets until they reach a certain age. Because you see, if you die, yeah, we'll appoint, the state will appoint a conservator. But at age 18, the kid comes out and says, hi, I want my inheritance. And, you know, there are kids, quite frankly, that are not competent at age 18 to handle like a million dollars that they would receive as an inheritance. You may also find as life goes on that you can identify members in your family who are just incompetent. They simply can't manage money or they have addiction problems. And if you left them the money, guess where it was going to go? Or maybe they joined a cult that you don't believe in what the cult believes in. So you explore using this testamentary trust for other kinds of things. Also, let's think about an incapacitated spouse. And it doesn't always mean dementia or Alzheimer's. People can have strokes, they can have a brain injury from an accident, and they just can't manage money. You know, I've got a friend whose husband has Parkinson, and she's wanting to provide a testamentary trust for the care of him and have somebody else be making those decisions because, excuse me, he's just not, he can't do it. He just can't handle that. And, and we think about this, you know, let's say that this mom dies and what happens is that um, dad has Alzheimer's. Well, mom dies without a will. It goes all to dad. The son doesn't receive anything or the grandkids don't receive anything. It all goes to dad. Well, we're going to have to have a conservator and a guardian appointed for dad because he can't. He's incapacitated. And mom could have done some planning ahead of time and say, what I want to do is establish a testamentary trust for him so that when I'm gone, the money goes into the trust and then she names her son as the trustee 
to manage the assets for him. So that's another use for a testamentary trust. So my tip from an explorer's junction is it really could help avoid a guardianship and conservatorship procedure, not only for minor children, but somebody that is incapacitated. Now, here we have a wood lily. And I want to, I guess I would say I would explore discretionary and mandatory terms in the testamentary. When you're doing discretionary, what you're saying to the trustee is I want you to use this for the health, education, maintenance, and support of my nephew. Okay, that's all you've told the trustee. Well, that's a challenge because Chris would like to take a trip during the summer to explore Europe. He says it would be such an educational experience. Okay, you're the trustee. Would you provide the funds so that Chris would have a trip to explore Europe? Uh, because the, the trip would be so educational. Well, I'm seeing here that the majority of you, 67% are saying no way. Well, maybe you just said no, but yeah, it depends a lot on who the trustee and you know their value system and any kind of conversations that they may have had with uh, the person that formed the trust. The mandatory, would be dictated by the trust document. So it's mandatory that it be distributed at specific dates or occurrences in the future. And we've talked about those a little bit. Uh, the beneficiary would receive all funds on reaching an age of 25, 40. Maybe they get payments intervals by age 25, then some at 30, and then some at 35. So I'm a little curious here about life stages. When you say graduation from college, you're kind of limiting it to just those that go to college. Uh, marriage, birth of the first child, but the second child doesn't get any. You got to think about these things and what might be the impact on the family. You would also use percentages now instead of dollar amounts because we could see how the market's gone up and down. And so an attorney is going to recommend fractions or percentages like 10% to this person, 40% to that person and what have you. And you could say, for example, 55% to the 4-H Foundation. And my favorite 45% to the MSU Alumni Foundation for the benefit of the estate planning program with the MSU Extension. Hi. I would use the money very appropriately. Okay. Now, the cost would depend on the complexity of the instrument, the amounts of assets that you have in. And I've had a couple of here in town that have said, we don't do ranches or farms. We don't accept, if we're a corporate trustee here, less than $300,000. So you may find that you don't have enough money going into your trust that you could have a corporate sponsor or trustee that you may end up asking Uncle George or Cousin Martha to be the trustee. And it's a big responsibility. Uh, to do something like that, because no matter what, you're going to find some trustees don't like you for the decisions that you make. So you have to be very, very strong. Now, corporate trustees, what do they charge to manage? Well, it varies. They may have just an annual fee of $1,600 to $3,000. Some of them also have management fees in addition to so if you want to explore any of those, uh, say, banks, if there was a credit union or a corporate trustee, most of them have a sheet with all that kind of information on there. So you would be able to get that and aid in your decision making. So I'm curious, what do you think would be the best age to distribute assets in a trust? 
20 to 25, 26 to 30. We get up all the way to 61 years. What would you think is the ideal time to give assets from a return, from a trust? I'm a big fan of puns, so I really appreciate that. You're a big fan of what? Puns. That's a pun? The wood. What do you oh. think of the wood? Yeah, I didn't even know what I was doing, but yeah, it's a pun. I was trying to figure out a way I could use it, you know. So thank you for that feedback. Well, Liz, I'm seeing that um, we have 75% that say 31 years to 40, and we've got 25% say 25 to 30. But what I see from that is you're saying you just don't think somebody is let's call them just financially mature until about age 25 or so. And that's good because it gives them time to experience some life, establish some of their financial values and start saving. Okay, so a testamentary trust could be used to protect those that are living with some sort of dementia and a financially incompetent heir. So I'm curious, do you at this point in time have a testamentary trust? Yes or no? I should have put another one in there thinking about it. Okay, at this point, again, we've got 100% that say that they don't. So my sense is you're here to learn, and I hope you've gotten some things out of this. Uh, to learn about revocable and testamentary. Okay, here we have the Bitterroot family. And let's see, we've talked a little bit about how parents can have this property and each parent have a revocable trust, like what we talked about before, that the wife can get the home, even the case where the son or, or the two boys can get the land. And I just showed you previously of her getting it all. Well, she doesn't have to. Maybe she has some of her own assets that would help with, you know, keeping her alive, so to speak. And then the home can go down to the beneficiaries, his children. So you can use these trusts also for those of you that are maybe in remarriages and protect your children. And so you need to have the conversation with your spouse, particularly if you've got that property in joint tenancy, because you're going to have to sever that and let each person leave to their own children. Well, my observation from the lady slipper is that once again this evening, time has just slipped away. Um, I hope I steered you to become aware of the uses of a revocable trust in an estate plan. I also hope I helped you to become aware of the uses for a testamentary trust and your circumstances may be different and you're coming up with some of the ideas that once I mentioned some things you could go oh I could see how this could help mom or Susie or my friends who don't even have a will you're wanting to share that information so if you don't have a memory like this elephant's head well, what can you do? Well, we've got those 50 mock guides and two of those have to do with testamentary revocable. And we have another one on using trusts in a blended family that I think that you might be interested in as well. And if you don't find them at the website, you can also go to our county extension office that is located at the fairgrounds here in Bozeman. So there I am again, and I want to open it up to questions so that I can see if I know any answers or not. So Liz, what kind of questions did, do we have? So far, we don't have any. Um, oh, really? You know, yeah. I just covered everything and nobody has a question. So far, That'll we'll give people first. a little bit of time to, to write anything in. Um, just because it's come up in the previous things and it came up in the conversation earlier today, just to reiterate about the April workshop in Columbus, 
to find oh, for the people that want to write wills yeah yeah you first need to get in contact with katie lovell at the senior and long-term care division okay. and she will return your call send you the papers that they would like for you to fill out you mail those in and that gives them a chance to look over it and start some of the process and then they'll schedule you for an appointment in Columbus if you decide that you want to to go there. And it what is it? It's about an hour away in yeah. good weather. Yeah. Hopefully by April we'll have some good weather. Oh, don't <laughs> count on it. <laughs> I've seen snow in July here in Bozeman. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. But hopefully, yes. Okay. Well, I still don't have any questions. Um, okay. I'm going to ask people to raise their hands if they're working on typing it so we don't cut you off. Um, give people another minute while I stall. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just a reminder that this is these videos will be online. So I know there's a lot of information in this last one. So you can review it on YouTube. Um, you can always share And also with the Mont Guides. Yep. And the Mont Guides are also available online. Um, and... I'm not seeing any indications anybody has any questions. So Okay, well, Liz, once again, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity. Thanks to the library and you for making this possible. I've enjoyed you know, sharing my, my thoughts and education <laughs> and uh, about estate planning because that sort of is my passion next to wildflowers. <laughs> and if you have topics that you're interested in for, you know, next fall or sometime, just let Liz know. And yeah. uh, she's our, our organizer for these kinds of things. Yeah. So I'll thank you and I'll go. Fix right. supper. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you everybody. Have a good night.